Steve Pistorius. I was born November 16th, 1954 in Port Sulphur, Louisiana, just south of here. All right. Uh, so, uh, Port Sulphur, tell me about, like, how long did you stay there? Not as long. A, as a child. I was born there because my New Orleans-born father was in the Army. And tied up with that, my mother came down here. My grandfather worked for the Freeport Sulphur Company and was in Port Sulphur. So I went there to be, my mother went there to be born, to have me. Right. <laughs> so your, your family was up here and she, like, she went down there, like the... Uh, well, my father was in Virginia, actually, okay, in, in okay. the Army. Oh, so she went to kind of be with her family right. uh, down there. To give birth to me. Right, right. And how long, so when did you come back here to New Orleans? We moved to this area when I was about six. Okay. So what was, your, what was the history of your family in New Orleans before you were born, both sides? My father's side of the family is from New Orleans in this third, third or fourth generation he is. So his, uh, his great-grandfather came here from Germany, I believe, mm -hmm. had a meat market on Britannia Street. And the uh, interesting story about the meat market is during the Depression, my father told me that he gave away meat to all the people who lost everything mm -hmm. and wouldn't serve the rich people first. I thought that was a neat, neat thing that he did. So, did you ever, did you know your grandfather? Nope. Never. Sure didn't. Did he, he pass away before uh, you were kind of... I, guess. I didn't even know my father's father, so... Oh, okay. Uh, he passed away before I was born. Yeah, so, what, uh, what uh, brought the family back here to New Orleans? And, like just said, why not just settle in Port Sulphur? Like, uh, well, my, then my grandfather just lived there temporarily when okay. he was working for Freeport Sulphur Company. My father was already from here, so we just moved here. So when you moved back here, where did you, where, where did you guys settle? We, I grew up in Kenner. Okay, okay. These are things I usually don't tell people. <laughs> <laughs> it's on need-to-know basis. So. So, it uh, wasn't my fault. Okay. End <laughs> of interview. <laughs> <laughs> he grew up in Kenner, canceled. <laughs> So you, uh, your family moved, uh, you guys, you're out in Kenner, and what are your parents doing at that point? Like when you're like, like 1960, I guess, you're back here. Mid-60s. Right? And? My father worked, my mother didn't work for a while, and then she worked for a, for a doctor. What, what sort of work did your father do? He uh, sold heavy equipment. Okay. And so with a family background like that, how did, when did you kind of first start when did you first come to music? Did, was it a part of their family life at all? I started playing piano when I was a little kid. And I, my great aunt had a piano, and they were in uh, Independence, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of my father's side of the family from there. And uh, I would sit at the piano and pick out melodies, and the relatives would all be gathered around and give me a dollar every time I played a melody. So. <laughs> <laughs> You quickly learned. Yeah, and then when we moved to Kenner, my father bought a piano for $25 somewhere and brought it home in the back of a pickup truck with some of his pals. And they took it off the truck and it wouldn't fit in the house, so it sat on the carport. It was an open carport. <laughs> and that's where I learned to play. Uh, and he bought, he bought it specifically so you could... Yeah. Was there, did you ever feel any pressure to not be a musician or were you? Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> plenty. To, to, <laughs> tell me about that. Like, a, did it, well, where was it, where did that come from? I was from? supposed to get a, my father. I was supposed to get a real job and join the service and all that kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't, it, you know, I wasn't going to be any kind of profession to play music. And I just kept playing anyway. So when did you... Was there at any at any point in your youth did you like realize like uh, I'm actively this is what I'm going to actively pursue and I'm not going to um, do uh, do what my father is wanting me to do like not you're not going to enlist in, uh, in the army you're not going to like get a quote unquote real job I never considered doing what he wanted me to do <laughs> ever <laughs> I just kept doing what I wanted to do right I started school at. Uh, LSU and Baton Rouge, briefly, and ended up dropping out. Um, what year? Around what year is that? So it was seventy-two. Yeah. So nineteen seventy-two, very kind of like probably a, a nice heady time to start going to college. You're right. uh, you're at LSU. What are you? 
at this point, like how long have you been, how long have you been playing piano? A few years, mm-hmm. you know. So was trying to trying to work stuff out on the piano. I had uh, hadn't had much. I hadn't had any professional experience at all. Um, I played around with music that sort of like ragtime stuff. LSU is when I first heard classic ragtime music. I love love music that sounded like early jazz and, and ragtime and stride piano and stuff like that. I didn't know what to call it, mm-hmm. and I, I went to uh, somebody's dorm one night, and there was a lobby with a piano in it, and someone was in there playing Scott Joplin rags, and I ran in there and I said, who wrote that? Where can I get the music? And what do you call it? And a guy named Scott Joplin wrote this, and it's called the Maple Leaf Rag, and you can get music for this. So a friend got me a book of Scott Joplin rags, and I started trying to tackle some of them. You know, it, uh, it, I was 17 then. Your freshman year. Yeah. And I got I, I started playing professionally when I was 18. I dropped out of college. Uh, I started music school at LSU. They gave me a hard time about not having any training. <laughs> so, they kind of made fun of me. Like, kind of, or they did make fun. Well, of they you. did. One of the yeah, one of the professors said, uh, "Why don't you? Why don't you do something? Did you do anything else well in high school, or did it, you should do that? If you did anything <laughs> else well, you should do that instead of music." I said, "I want to play music." And then they put me in a baby piano class where the first thing she did, she, she said, is, this is middle C. And we were da 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 And I, I went to the teacher after the class and said, I don't mean to be you know, arrogant or anything, but I, I don't belong in this class. I know more than this already. I need to be in a better class than this. And she said, well, take this music and, and practice it over the weekend and come back and play it for me Monday morning at 9 o'clock. And if you do well, we'll put you in a better piano class. And I worked my butt off all weekend and learned those little classical pieces she, she gave me and played them flawlessly on Monday morning. They put me in a better class. Mm-hmm. You know. and yet, but you still dropped out. I dropped out anyway. <laughs> what did you I had some other issues brewing with involving alcohol and things. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's college. Uh, <laughs> so. What, so what had you been playing? Like a, like, I mean, you, you said you were like a little bit aware of... What uh, of the sound of ragtime, but you didn't know what to call it. What had you been playing, and what like what what had you been listening to before you got to college? Had you been coming into New Orleans at all to hear anybody play, or only yeah, a couple of times been to Preservation Hall. I remember hearing bands there. And in fact, when I was seventeen, I got in a really bad car accident. Went out while I was at LSU before I dropped out, and had a cast from here to here on my my right arm, and I remember coming into Preservation Hall with some people my age, and uh, I, I was 17 actually, and uh, Big Jim Robinson was on trombone that night. Mm-hmm. And who else, was it, was it Billy and Dee Dee Pierce were playing? I'm trying to remember who was playing. They all signed my cast, and I wish I had that cast. They all signed it, and uh, I don't know what happened to it, but um, I had intended to save it. Right. Oh, <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> So, it sounds like you're like oh, when you're that age, like you'd still like really didn't know that like you were going like, like not many seventeen year olds know anything about what they're gonna be doing, like thirteen, twenty, whatever years from then. But it sounds like you were still kind of basically forming your identity as a piano player. I didn't know what I, I didn't know I wanted to do that for a living. Right. I really didn't. I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. No. Oh. Well. At one point. But well, after yeah. I dropped out of LSU, I took a job as a professional house washer. I had to do something. What does a professional house washer do? You do pressure washers. Yeah. <laughs> it was terrible. Where, where, uh, where, uh, where were you doing that? In New Orleans. Okay, okay. It was terrible. That's where I learned how to smoke cigarettes, which I've <laughs> since given up. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> got through college without that. And uh, I saw an ad in the paper one day for a barrel house piano player. The Times Picayune, and I decided to answer the ad. I thought it was something I might be able to do, so I showed up, and I was the only person that showed up at the audition, and I got the job. And it was at a pizza parlor in Metairie with with a banjo player named Neil Untersayer, who's played here for years, Preservation Hall. He's still living, and we still play together. Okay. When I was 18, and I, I got that job, and 
it was five nights a week, and I made $150 a week for playing five nights. I had more money than I knew what to do with. I was like, <laughs> got my first apartment on Banks, off of Bank Street on South Cortez in right. Mid City. Split it with a, one of my best friends. And the total cost was one twenty-five a month. We paid sixty-two fifty a piece for this giant half a double shotgun. Mm-hmm. So, did you when you got this job? Did you know what you were doing? The, like, a, or were you flying? Like, no, Neil Intersair. I, I credit him with being my mentor because he he really taught me how to play with music with another person. I had you got to have some basic raw materials to play this music, you know. Right. But you you have to have somebody to help you develop them, and uh, and guide you and tell you don't do that, do this, try this, don't try that, you know. And he was so patient with me. So, I think he only yelled at me one time. What did he yell at you for? for going mind. to the, not going to the bridge at the right time or speeding up or something. It was something stupid or not playing the right chords. You know that he told me a million times, but. Um, and he patiently taught me good chords to play. Uh, I was very fortunate that I listened to the older guys too. He wasn't the only, the only mentor I had. He was the first mm-hmm. in this music, and uh, taught me good melodies and good chords, and and how to play with other people. Uh, so describe to me like a kind of an average night at this uh, pizza parlor with you, like you're playing barrel house piano, banjo player with you. Describe like. What is your repertoire? Are you guys basically kind of, this is like right post the sting. So Yeah, and yeah, we got a request for that all the time. Like you're playing the entertainer like almost probably every night. All the time. But uh, so what else, are, what, what sort of repertoire are you developing there? Like what We played, doing? Neil and I played all kind of stuff. We've played, we, we've worked a bunch of <coughs> ragtime numbers, old pop tunes, a lot, of, a lot of the repertoire that the early jazz bands played. We played with piano and banjo. And I even started a little ragtime club briefly, Scott Joplin Ragtime Club, and uh, had a few meetings out there and had one of the early ragtime composers that was living from New Orleans, Erwin LeClaire, mm-hmm. actually showed up one night. And he had some dementia going on, but he could still play. And he and his wife showed up, and he was so proud to be recognized a little bit. He wrote some tunes that a lot of jazz bands have recorded over the decades, like uh, Triangle Jazz Blues, he wrote a popular tune called Cookie. He used to have a radio show in New Orleans. So that was the highlight of that little ragtime club at Shakey's Pizza Parlor. So it, yeah, so you just like like-minded individuals. How did you get the word out for people to come hang I out? I just spread the word. I just told some friends and they told other friends. Never many people showed up, just a few. All right. But it was fun for a little while. But the, otherwise, we did had to do sing-alongs and things like that, and there was evil high school age kids that would come in there and they figured out how to turn the jukebox on from behind. They'd turn the jukebox on while we were playing. <laughs> so we have to go unplug it. <laughs> Hide the cord. All right. Oh. Yeah. Critics. It was a great first job, you know. So, and what you're describing to me now is basically you're kind of, you're, I mean, you're finding your place. Maybe without even realizing it, you're finding your calling. And you're finding your community uh, out there, Shakey's in Metairie, where I hope they had the Mojo Potatoes back then. I don't know if they... Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> we ate a lot of pizza, though. <laughs> a lot of so-so pizza. <laughs> I drank a lot of pitchers of beer. Uh, did, you, did, you get was, the beer, did you get the beer for free? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Well, that's Big much, pitchers of, yeah. As an 18-year-old, 19-year-old, it's pretty much all you need, pizza and beer and a job. Well, I was apartment. happy. I had my first apartment. And a nice car. Any girlfriend or anything? Like, uh... <laughs> no, not that, but I, I, I did have all the other stuff. Okay. So you're kind of developing then, like you're just by, almost by accident, it seems like you're finding your place in the New Orleans jazz community. How did you start finding the others, as they say? Uh, people are, are hearing uh, you have this composer come out there who heard about your ragtime club you have a composer come out there right so you are learning about the larger world of New Orleans jazz and when did you start like kind of going out and playing other spots we, we left Shakey's and, and went down to the Bourbon Street and played the uh, the Gateway Lounge at Iberville and Bourbon as a duo you're right with it we know we got a drummer okay 
and we started playing that place. First we played, uh, actually first we played the Holiday Inn, which is now something else on Royal. Okay. We played there for a while, and then we went to the Gateway Lounge on Bourbon and played there. That's when they had a lot of jazz on Bourbon Street. Right. You know, and it was all New Orleans style jazz. It wasn't all great, but it was all, at least they had jazz, live music and jazz. Like, some of the places had like three shifts a day. Right, right, right. Of music. You know, it wasn't anything like it is now. Like, uh, so, like, uh, what, what's the name of the band at this point? Do you guys have a name for your company? We decided to call it the Raspberry Ragtimers. All right, all right. And how long did the Raspberry Ragtimers last? Um, till 74, 70, close to 75, almost 1975. Then I decided I was going to go join another band in St. Louis. That It was another trio that played Ragtime. I decided to do some traveling for a few years at that okay. point. Okay, so uh, uh, where'd you go? I, uh, you started in St. Louis? I played on a riverboat in St. Louis for a while. A supper club on the river mm -hmm. with a trio, and I'd heard I'd heard that trio in New Orleans with their other piano player um, earlier in the '70s, and they played at the Marriott Hotel, and their piano player was playing piano on his day off. There was a famous fire at a gay bar called the Upstairs. I think it was called the Upstairs Lounge. Oh, the, yeah, it's an incredible. Yeah, it was incredibly, horrible. Incredibly sad. He was playing piano in there when the fire happened and died and uh, so they asked me to play piano after that with that band oh. so and I, I loved that band when I heard them so it was like a dream come true so I went up to St. Louis and, and played on that boat for a while with that band left them came back home and started working around New Orleans more now do, do you was that a, do, you feel, do you feel like looking back was that a good move for you like to actually get out of New Orleans for a little bit and to it happened like it happened I mean I think everything happens for a reason in a person's life when you look back on it you don't know why it's happening at the time but mm -hmm. it all led to good good places so I think it's where fate was just leading me so I went to St. Louis for a while I came back home then I, I moved to Florida and played with the band down in Fort Myers for for a while in Tampa then ended up back in New Orleans, like in 1979, okay. and got an apartment in the French Quarter. Uh -huh. and, uh, but when, when the first band had moved to the Quarter to play on Bourbon Street, that's when I started really getting to know the New Orleans people better. So who were you, uh, who were you listening to here in the Quarter? Who were, like, who were, uh, who were some of the musicians that you, that you followed, if you can remember? Like, were there any bands? Or any particular people that you were just like fascinated with? Or? Yeah, Armand Hug was a great piano player and a very nice man. He was mm -hmm. one of the great New Orleans piano players. He wrote a lot of great tunes too. And where did you see him play? Some hotel he was playing in. I can't remember where it was. And then I played some convention party and he was on the bill and I was listening to him play and you know, some somebody got me on the bill to play a couple of numbers, and he was very supportive and very nice to me. You know, and, uh, I don't remember who else I met during that time. I really didn't get into it, into the thick of things in New Orleans until I finished traveling like 1979. Had you been coming to the hall at all during? Uh, Sometimes, yeah. But uh, was it like a, a destination for you, or just kind of like, oh, let me go, just go see what's going on? I'll just come down and listen. Okay. So you go away for a while, and you come back, kind of to live, I guess, full time here, starting in 1979. Now, what sort of musician are you at this time? At, at this at this point, had you started your like kind of extensive? Scholarship into the history of ragtime music yet, or yeah, yeah, I had. And I'd really fallen in love with Jelly Roll Morton several years earlier. That he became my hero of the piano. Can you describe me like how you first like kind of clicked with him? Or? Just heard it. Just. It's magic, to me. Right. You know, and I and I love uh, the Stride School of Piano and and other New Orleans players, but. Um, and other ragtime composers and things like that. But Jelly Roll Morton, you know, that's it. That's that's the king to me. Is there any like particular like tune of his or any particular like one like anything that like just kind of really got you? Like 
Was his story, like him being from here, was it just his... His playing, his piano playing it has everything New Orleans in it. Every, every bit of New Orleans thing you hear in any other kind of music that came after has that influence in it. Without Jillero Morton, I believe that there would have been no Professor Longhair, no, no Booker, no, none of the, no Dr. John, none of this, the other styles that we have. That, and people center on Professor Longhair today. They, they tend to do that, like O.Z. is just obsessed with long hair and they don't go back any farther. Right, it's, right. It's, and it's not, that's not a good thing, I don't think. It was, without Morton, it had none of this stuff. Like he's the father. I'm considered a dinosaur because I don't play <laughs> Professor Long Hair music. I love it, but I mean... But you don't, you don't see it, it's like it doesn't, Professor Long Hair doesn't need you. Jelly Roll Morton. There's, like there's a, a million guys trying right. to play like Professor Long Hair. I don't need to do it. And that doesn't make me as happy as, as the Jelly Roll Morton style. So... I know it makes you happy. Right, right. I know it's, it's, it's hard actually to put your finger on something, why something in particular just makes you, like kind of thrills you and moves your soul, but... It's very personal. Yeah. What are, like, does For it... everybody. Does it make you, does, does his music make you think of certain things? What are like, what are the elements of his music or his compositions that like, you said like it embodies everything. It, it's like, a feel. Right. It's a feel and it creates joy. It brings me joy. Right. And it doesn't bring everybody joy, but it brings me joy and a lot of other people. But you know, it, 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 different music speaks to different people. Right. I think. Mm-hmm. You know, and it isn't like I said; it's an intensely personal thing, mm-hmm. in my opinion. It's you know. like it's something that you heard, and you're like, yeah. I, I recognize that within myself. Or... There's some kind of music, certain types of music that I think is uh, is not very good, but other people love it, right. and it, it makes them happy. So I have to respect that. That's very interesting. Like, so you come back here in 79, do you feel like you have any sort of, like, <clears throat> any sort of mission or any sort of calling at that point? Or are you just like, you're back here to work? I was just, I was living in the French Quarter for the right. first time. I just wanted to work and have party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a job at the gazebo, which was opened in 1980, or end of 79 by guy from Boston and he wanted classic ragtime piano in that place. Where where's the gazebo? In the French market. Okay. Oh that Yeah, that one. Yeah. It was a great place. And uh and John Royne and I used to go around playing four handed piano mm-hmm. in those days and we stopped at the gazebo one night and there was this young kid playing piano in there and he was he was blind. And John and I sat in and we took the poor guy's job. The boss wanted us to work there after that, and they got rid of him, and I felt so bad I went and found him another job oh. <laughs> somewhere at a hotel. Uh, do you remember his name? No. Oh. I just remember feeling terrible. We didn't mean to take his job. We just we started, we were just out drinking, playing four-handed piano one night. And we sat down at the piano, and the boss says, I want you all to work here. <laughs> so, and then, then he, then he wanted just, just ragtime after that. So how long did you stay at the gazebo? I oh, I don't know. I worked there for several years off and on, and then it changed hands, and then we had ended up having uh, uh, more than piano there. They ended up with uh, traditional jazz quartets in there. So a lot of good musicians played in that place. And we're always treated well, and it was a great place to play. And all these New Orleans characters would come out on Sunday for, during the daytime. That's when we played in the daytime. Like, tell me about a Sunday there. Like a... Mr. Smiley Urell, old, he's been dead for years. But he, everybody loved him in the quarter. He'd, he'd come down, he would, he would do second line dances, and he was just a character. Right. Uh, a bunch of uh, old time New Orleans people, including some of the Bechet family, would come out. Really? There's a whole lot of relatives of Bechet in New Orleans. And, and the... old timers like that. Olga McCarthy, that used to work here at the hall in the 80s, um, New Orleans lady. Would, would come out. Anne Lane, the umbrella lady. You know, all these great New Orleans characters every Sunday and just dancing, umbrellas, everything. So the, the, all day. the, the gazebo is just like a, it's just a, it's like a, almost like a community center. It was corner. wonderful, yeah, yeah. Right. Like that went on for a long time, too. Would like Ruthie come by? Like Ruthie, the duck lady. Yeah. I remember her coming by on roller skates one day, almost knocking me off the piano bench. She took a run and slide on the piano bench <laughs> and <laughs> Boom, give me a cigarette. 
<laughs> you give her a cigarette, she'd always say, give me another one for later. <laughs> so, all right, you've, so now you're back here in New Orleans, you've established, your, like, semi-established yourself, you got this gig at the, gig at the gazebo, you kind of got this Sunday thing going on. When did you, were you starting to play with other folks around the quarter at that time? Were you starting to kind of become part of more like the, the fabric of the jazz scene? Yeah, the quarter and around? yeah, I was. And, and sometime late in 1980 or so, I started uh, playing at Preservation Hall. And I was also doing gigs with uh, various people. There were some Englishmen in town I did some gigs with, like Clive Wilson and Chris Burke. They'd been here since the 60s. And um, they always had New Orleans, old-time New Orleans musicians in their bands. Mm -hmm. So I get, there was a place called Danner Plantation out in New Orleans East. Now it's some kind of wedding reception hall or something. But uh, we used to play out there a couple of nights a week with people like Chester Jones, great old-time New Orleans drummer. So I got exposed to people like that. And um, I moved to Toulouse and Royal in what, 80... Must have been 81. Mm -hmm. And the hall, yeah, that's, that's when I, was, end of 80? I can never remember dates. <laughs> close to that. Right. Um, the hall called me, because I lived close by, and I said, Sweet Emma is real sick, and she doesn't want to play the whole night sometimes, so can you come and sit by her and play when she stops playing? And so that's what I would do. I, I'd come over whenever they called me, and I'd sit with Emma, and if she stopped playing, I would play. And if she reached, she only had the use of one hand. And if she reached up and started playing, I would stop. And most of the time when I was playing, she was pulling my shirt sleeve from her wheelchair, which was lower than the piano bench, and talking to me in my ear, telling me stories and stuff. It was great. What, what, like, what sort of stories would she be? I don't know. She was, how many skirts you got? You know, <laughs> that would tell you, about 15. Oh, you're going to catch something. <laughs> Don't well, put that on. <laughs> you don't put that on there. No, that's real history, my friend. Uh, like, but while she had a great sense of humor. Once she got used to you, she got a great sense of humor. But while you're playing a song, like you're playing, like oh yeah, I'd feel a tug and she'd pull me down <laughs> and start saying stuff. Would you be sitting there like trying not to laugh while you're? Uh, like, oh, I just a, laughed. At you. Like, <laughs> I, was, I just thought it was great, and then. Uh, yeah, and then she passed away, and uh, they'd hired me to go, Alan Jaffe had hired me to go on a tour with uh, Kid Sheik's band, which was the band that Emma played with. Um, and Emma died as soon as we left mm. on, that, on that trip. She was too sick to travel. And they gave me the job, the two nights a week in here, after, after Emma died. So uh, it was quite an honor to have that job. And you've been playing here at the hall, like basically. I didn't continue that as long as I should have. I was young and stupid. I took another job and lost my chance to travel extensively with the hall. So what happened? Like, what what, what job was it that, that took you? It was back? another six night a week job at the Sheraton Hotel, and I was kind of pressured into either doing all six nights or not having the job at all. I think a, a lot uh, of people who, especially like freelance work, are, are familiar with that sort of. That uh, you know, that choice. Like, you know, do I want to eat regularly, or do I want to like go for the same? Maybe pays a little bit less, but it's long. It's a it's a hard choice. It is, and and I I don't think that was the right choice. But it, you know, as I said earlier, I think things work out like they're supposed to. So, how long did you play with Kid Sheik's band then? Oh, I, off and on for a good while, and it, I went to Singapore with that band. And what what year? You remember? Nineteen eighty one. Wow. So you really kind of lucked into... That was great. Father Al Lewis was on banjo, Alonzo Stewart on drums. Preston Jackson played with Louis Armstrong's All-Stars. He was on trombone. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to come along in time to meet and play with some of those guys. The drummers, oh my God, the drummers. Louis Barbaran, Sahi Frazier. I played gigs with those guys. And I'm the envy of young musicians who love this music for that. When I talk about playing with them, you got to play with them? I said, yeah. yeah. And it was an experience I'll never forget because they had a feel. Talk about the New Orleans feel. That they, Saeed Frazier and Louis Barbaran, that, that was it. Yeah. Joe yesterday was talking about Saeed Frazier. Like, uh, oh, talking, about, talking about 
his press rolls, like talking about like yeah, and the turnarounds in between courses, you know, just kind of just look, you feel like you're levitating when he when he, when he played, you know, just made you happy. That's what New Orleans music is supposed to do to you. Mm -hmm. But very few people, and, and the drums really can capture that or not capture it. And uh, I agree, I agree. Like the you know, you it's hear not it. something everybody can do. No, but you hear a good New Orleans rhythm, you you know it, and it kind of hits it's, you. It's not like the street beat stuff people are playing today. It's not that at all. It's not what people think it is. You know, and, and one of the few people that can really pull it off today, like almost nobody else living, is Ernie Ellie, in my opinion. Like, well, know, why, why is that? Tell me a little bit about him. It just feels right. right. It feels like those old timers when Ernie's playing, like going in from the dirge part of Closer Walk With Thee to the, to the parade part. Mm -hmm. When he brings in the band to the four four, you know, the up, up tempo, it just lifts you up. It's that, yeah, that's it. That's and you, you know it when you hear it, and you also know it when you don't hear it. <laughs> so it's like, I wasn't quite it. I'm not quite excited, you know. Yeah, right, right. It's like not quite. Getting that's what it. made people dance like that. Right. You know, you made them move their hips like that. Yeah, you know. that's exactly what it was. Do I mean, that dip. Comes out more in the drums than anything else. Mm -hmm. So I'm so lucky I got to work with those guys and play music with them. They were such kind people and nice to younger people. And uh, people like Kid Sheik were wonderful with me too. He was like a grandfather. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, we went on tour with him on a, a bus tour of the southern states before we went to Singapore, I think. And uh, first night in the hotel, I get a call from Sheik. He says, come to my room. He's got a piece of paper and he's got all the tunes written down that we're going to play at the concert the next night and the keys. He says, I just wanted you to see these in advance in case there's anything you don't know. Make sure you're comfortable with everything. And I thought that was just great. Mm -hmm. you know? I, I was expecting to say, and the next night we played totally different tunes. No, no, you wouldn't do that. <laughs> no, they were great. And people like Willie Humphrey was, was you know, and they would give you some advice sometimes, you know, the younger guys. They're always very kind. And Willie Humphrey turned around and, and, I mean, one night he was closest to the piano in there and he said, son, hit the, hit the chord real nice for me, real strong on the first beat so I know where I am. Mm -hmm. You talk about a piece of valuable information playing jazz band piano for a young person. And I've gotten more compliments on that my whole career than on any other thing that I do. You know, providing the right rhythm behind horn players, behind soloists. See, that's a... Largely because he said that to me. That's a great nugget. That's like, that's wisdom for... You don't get that ages. in the classroom. You'll never get that in the classroom. So, I try to share these things with other people, all these nice principles that I've learned that you can't get in any classroom. Mm -hmm. You know, and I teach a jazz camp every year, the one that, Banu Gibson does, and I've taught other jazz camps, and I, I, they, they never get what they think they're going to get. They get these principles, you know. And, oh, really? And so, we thought you were going to write stuff down for us to play. No. No, <laughs> no. no it's, it's all here. Yeah. It's like, you can have some of it on here, you, but you, you develop the mechanical skill, but, you know. Well, why, we want to know what you play with your left hand. I said, no, you don't. That's what I play with my left hand. You want to listen to what Jelly Roll Morton does with his left hand. Fats Waller, James B. Johnson, you know. That's what that's what left hands you want to listen to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're like giving like almost spiritual lessons, like kind of. Yeah. Kind of. So in the let's take a little bit back to Jelly Roll Morton now. So when are you where when in your life you're noticing that like people seem to have been not so much forgetting Jelly Roll Morton, but just like kind of uh, just not giving him his due because. You have a reputation now for being kind of uh, basically like a Jelly Roll Morton apostle. Uh, oh, sort of. You know, it's, like you, uh, it's, it's something that's near and dear to your heart. So when did you start kind of like really making it part of your identity? Or was, is there any like kind of particular moment where you realize I've got to start like just spreading the good word about him whenever I can? Well, I, talk, I like to talk about it, and right. push it, but mostly I like to have the feel in my playing. And, and that's the nicest compliment I get to this day, is I hear Jelly Roll Morton in your playing, because you can't imitate something like that. Right. Well, 
uh, do you think you could play a little bit of Jelly Roll Morton for us and like kind of, uh, I mean, we could talk about it all day, but it's about hearing it. And yeah. Can we? Uh, You're already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to, not warmed up, I'll try to play the Froggy Moore Rags, one of my favorites of his. Um, one of the reasons I like it so much is the way it's constructed, but the, the trio section, the last section, is one of the most beautiful sections of music ever written in jazz, I think, in early jazz. So beautiful that he made a separate song out of the, the trio section later on and called it Sweetheart of Mine. So, we'll give it a shot here. I'm not playing it again. No. <laughs> no. Oh, God, we forgot to hit record. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, it's fun to play. No, it's fun to hear. Beautiful to hear. Thanks. So, uh, tell me a little bit about that, that piece of music. If there's anything more to it like uh, than your, your, your feeling about like the, the, the trio and it, like the, like the European of its beauty. Do you know anything about the... Uh, the inception of that song, or do you know anything about it, like a, beyond a... No. He used a device called, what did he call it? Organ chorus or something like that. That first little chorus was like chimes mm -hmm. up there. I think he called it like an organ chorus doing that. And he liked doing stuff like that. Just for effect. He had all kind of devices that, you know, the typical New Orleans stuff that, that just felt good when he did them, that he created. Now, do you uh, like? Do you ever com uh, compose yourself? Do you ever? Uh, do you have you do? You, do you write more? Uh, I've written one tune, one in tune. my whole life. Yeah, I'm not a composer. 
not a composer. I, some people have that gift and some people don't. I don't. Every Most of the time I try to think of a melody and somebody else has already written it. Mm -hmm. so, well, that sounds like, no, it's not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> what is the one tune that you've written? I wrote a tune for my late partner, and it's called One for Kevin, and I put it on a CD of solos and duets that I did in 2005, finished it up after Katrina. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's a little Latin-flavored thing. But hopefully a little New Orleans feel to it. It's like there's a, uh, almost sounds like a, it might have like had some uh, got shock in it or something. I yeah, it's, it's pretty. And I got Evan Christopher played clarinet with me on it. And it's, it's a very pretty song. And it's original. Right, right. Other than that, I haven't been able to come up with a single original. No, there's so much out there already. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not torching yourself about it or anything. No, you're no, I'm not, going, oh. not the least bit. In fact, there's a lot of people who try to write music in this vain early jazz stuff and and sometimes they come up with a good one most of the time it's a watered down version of something else it's like pastiche and yeah not like i mean that. it doesn't have the meat you know, the substance and some of these early compositions i mean they're, they're, the material at the lewis armstrong hot fives and hot sevens recorded so it has meat on it it has substance you know and you, it's really hard to write music that compares to that mm -hmm any of those compositions. You know, in the early ragtime masters, it's really, I know there's some people that write ragtime today too, and some of it's very nice and original, but, but very few can, can pull it off. Oh, it's you like, know. you know, it's a, it's a music that was kind of derived from just like a time. It was yeah. a, it's all, everything, like the, it's the, what informs the composition are like, what's going on in the world at that time, like, you know, the, the early part of the, the 20th century. Yeah, like yeah. A, so after uh, you left Kid Sheik's band, or well, you, after you stopped playing with him as regularly, uh, what were you? Uh, what sort of gigs were you taking around the quarter? What else were you? Uh, what else were you? Doing? There was a lot of stuff going on in the early '80s. Right. You know, a lot of gigs. So I, I played at the Sheraton Hotel for a while, and then that was a six night a week gig. Yeah. yeah. I joined Banu Gibson's band. I was her first piano player. So she keeps coming up in conversation like a... Yeah, I was her first first guy that she, she hired when she started her band. Yeah. I work with her son-in-law. Do you really? Yeah, at the store. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, I see her grand, granddaughter all the time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Wow. So you were, you're working... Like, and she seemed like... A, um, Joe Lassie was talking about... Uh, playing with her and about how much he enjoyed uh, uh, like how he gives her a lot of credit for like just like employing a lot of people and just really kind of oh yeah I think I played when Joe was in the band some because I left her band after a couple of years and then David Bodinghouse came to town and he joined her band mm -hmm. and I think Joe was mainly playing with the band after I left it okay but we played at Bayard's Jazz Alley, which is now a karaoke joint. That was the best jazz club. When they had a lot of jazz clubs on Bourbon Street, Goodwins, that was the best. That why was the was, best. Why was that the best? It was just had the best bands, and the, it was the, run, the cleanest run place. It had the best piano. You know, it was run by a musician, and it uh, it lasted quite a while. We had Banu's band played in there several nights a week. What do you remember? What block that was on? Like that? St. Peter and Bourbon. Okay, so right. Famous corner. Wow. It was on where the karaoke joint is now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And at any point, had you been tempted to leave New Orleans again, or were you just like, I'm, I'm here now? No, I didn't. I, I've never wanted to live anywhere else since then. Right. Right. So. And how did you kind of find your way back to the hall? Then, or did you? They just started calling me for gigs. Right. We left on good terms. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like right. I mean, nothing terrible happened, but and they started calling me for, for odd jobs here and there, play with different bands. You know, but, and uh, like I said, I was lucky enough to play with a lot of those the early great bands that were here. I played with Kid Thomas's band and the Humphrey Brothers, and uh, so I got to experience all those guys firsthand. Mm -hmm. It's hard. There's not much of that going on anymore. Do you think it's gone for good, or do you no. think it's no? It's not. It'll never be gone for good. There's always going to be pockets of people around the world 
bringing it back and keeping it alive. Yeah. You know, you, I don't know why people want to change it. There's nothing wrong with it. But, <laughs> Who who uh, who do you think wants to change it? Like, what you, you get a feeling that people are now like kind of a lot of people want to change it. A lot of people for various reasons. When you when you play a certain type of music, if to do it well, you have to really love it. Right. You have to love it. That's the first ingredient. Then you have to have a little bit of talent. Then you have to develop that talent. But the first thing is you have to love something. And if somebody doesn't love early jazz music, I can spot them a mile away. Right. You're playing this for a paycheck. Shame on you. You'd rather be playing bebop down the street. You'd rather be playing rhythm and blues. You know, to at least be honest about it. If you, you know, yeah. but I can tell. It's like if you love rhythm and blues, play some. <laughs> yeah, but some yeah. some people go where the paycheck is, yeah. and some people can cross over and love more than one kind of music, and that's that's good. But they're not the norm. Well, now you're kind of in the position of being a mentor and to a lot of younger musicians. Like I was, I have uh, Charlie's um, a CD on my desk. He gave me a copy of uh, Quality 6 CD. And uh, I believe you're on the, you play on the Quality 6. CD. Oh, Halloran. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh yeah my like, God. Uh, and so you're kind of, you are one of the people now who is, Kind of a teacher, like like a teacher to the younger generation of jazz musicians who come here from like Charlie is from St. Louis. Uh, uh, like who else are you? Like a there's several. I've, I've worked with a bunch, and anybody that wants my help, I give it to them. And uh, piano players, people ask, well, what do you charge for lessons? Nothing. You love this music? I'll I'll show you anything I know. Mm -hmm. Just come over, and we'll work on it. We're not going to tell you what you want to hear. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, that's okay. <laughs> that's not how teaching works. <laughs> yeah, no, no. No. So who like uh, who are some of the folks that you like kind of who are who do you, who are you looking at nowadays? Like who are like who are the, the younger generation who are like, There's there's people? some some people that, that came after Katrina that, that love this music and, and want to have some high standards. It's not the majority, sadly. Right. It's a small minority, but uh, I'm working with some of them and, and a few other people I know that are close to my age are working with them. And I'll do anything in the world to help them. Right, right. And, uh, one of them is Alex Owen, young trumpet player. And uh, he wants to get more gigs that pay actual salaries rather than get away from these tip jar things, which are, could potentially ruin the music as a profession in this town. Tell me about that. Like I said, no one's no one's mentioned that before. Because people don't want to talk about it. But no, I, I, I'm I, not afraid to talk about I, it. I, I want to hear about that. Like, uh, are you talking specifically about the bands that like just have to like kind of job on Royal Street or just like? Uh, oh no no, you, street music yeah. is that's its own okay. thing. Yeah, that's like a you know that's you like boot camp. Yeah, <laughs> I mean you folks. play on the street all you want. Like, at one point in the '80s, early '80s, I made. Made rent playing on the street a couple of times. Oh yeah, did you uh, like? Did you have a piano you could wheel out there? Yep. Or? Pud Brown, a great clarinet player who died some years ago. Uh, he uh, his son had a piano on wheels and lived on the ground floor on St. Philip Street, and you could go get the piano and wheel it out. We used to wheel it out into Jackson Square. That's what I was doing in the eighties. I didn't tell you I was playing at the One More Time show as well. Oh yeah, with I played that orange. show for two yeah. years. Right over there. Uh, well, Orange had already gone to New York. Okay, okay. I played with the New Orleans cast after, after they went to, uh, the the cast that happened after they went to New York. So where where was that going on? Was it was it at the Tulu Street oh, Theater? Was, uh, Actually, okay, so, One Eye Jack's yeah. location now. Right, right. It was much nicer then. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work there. Uh, Did you? Yeah, I was I was a talent booker. Uh, okay. For a little while. But okay, so you were. How did you this piano? Did you have to like throw down like a five dollars to like to take it out for the day? No, or we just gave him an equal share of the tips. It mm -hmm. was on the honor system. Oh. And Pud Brown's son was just as eccentric as he was, and he had had all these projects that he did to make money. He didn't, wasn't a conventional person at all. He had a big telescope he'd wheel out to the um, by the Cafe Du Monde. Oh yeah. And people could look in the telescope and put in donations and stuff. Among other things, he did. And so we'd wheel the piano out, and at the end of the day, we'd bring it back and give them a, give them a fair share of the tips. 
Yeah, the piano probably paid for itself many oh, times yeah. over. <laughs> he kept it tuned and all. Look at that. Okay. But we had some one some days we'd have the, half the band and cast of the One More Time show out in the middle of Jackson Square. It was wonderful music. And this is all in the, the early to mid eighties. Uh, yeah. And I'd have my apartment was close by. We'd go to the, the apartment and get coffee or whatever and and eat lunch and you know, come back out and make some more money. And Sounds kinda idyllic. It was good. But I, this this new this new thing since Katrina is all these all these jobs music jobs that look like real jobs, but they're not. They're, it's, there's no money involved. It's just begging for money, passing a tip jar around, and maybe a percentage of the bar. And all my life, I've made salaries. I walk in, I know what I'm going to make. Right. And so is everybody else in New Orleans. That's how we do it. But yeah, in this kind of new, 20, new 21st century economy, it's a... Yeah, but they didn't ask anybody. They yeah. just showed up and started doing this. We have a, a, a deadly one-two punch to the professional music scene, too, in New Orleans. We have one thing is the right to work law, which makes it impossible to enforce yeah. any standards. Yeah. Impossible. If you complain, goodbye. You're fired. Or yeah. you're making, if you're making $100 for a three-hour gig, I can walk and say, I'll do this gig for 25 Okay, and there's nothing you can do. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is our union has no backbone. It's funny, like you don't even really hear about the union anymore. Oh like, no, I don't even know why I still belong. Even the pension is weak. But you know, with those two things prevent for us from having any real standards in the in the music business. It's, it's a, it's a. I don't know. This this place pays well and always has. Um, it's like the Palm Court, Windsor Court. Uh, Natchez, Steamboat, where I work, you know, good salaries. Yeah, they give you money for, yeah. for being, for having skills. And that's the way we always did it. We went to work and we knew what we were going to get, and the tips were a bonus. But if you didn't make any tips, well, I got my salary. You know, And never did we ever hold the tip jar on anybody's face. I can't imagine doing that to a customer. Yeah, Somebody I mean, that came in to hear my band, honored me by coming in to hear my band, I'm going to go stick a tip jar in their face and give us money. <laughs> I can't. No. Well, I see a lot of bands nowadays. They have they. I can see like the pressure they feel because they've got a. Every time they take a break, whenever they've got a hustle, like they've got like, kind of keep going on. Like oh, we got this, we got this, and we're gonna pass this around. Like uh, while you're watching us and hearing us play. Yeah, I know. And. So I mean, gosh, it's kind of a somber sort of. Well, thing. so I'm, I'm doing what I can to encourage people to do better. You can't force anybody to do anything, but, and like I said, that one-two punch with those two situations makes it really, really difficult mm -hmm. to enforce any standards. So, what are you, uh, what are you working on now? What, what is your passion right now? Besides just, you know, you play here at the hall, you have a few, like you have uh, a lot of recordings, uh, and uh, what are you kind of, what are you focusing on right now? Like, what are you? What are you uh... I started a project about, about two and a half years ago with Orange Kellen on clarinet and James Evans on clarinet and, and alto or C melody sax. And the, we went into the studio a little over two years ago and did a CD, and it just was magic. And that's kind of been my project ever since. So we, we've done two CDs now. What do you call that? Steve Pistorius trio or quartet, whatever we, you know. <laughs> but what about it that is like something that's kind of like, what about that has a... It's, has it's a magical combination, those two. Mm -hmm. I put them together. I've worked with Orange Kellen most of my life. James Evans I've known for about 25 years, but he, he just moved to New Orleans to stay mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, three, three years ago, I think. And uh, he's the son-in-law of Nina Buck that owns the Palm Court Jazz Cafe. Oh. Not bad. So, and they're both brilliant musicians. I just wanted to do a project with them, with them, and it just it just came out great. So, and I have to have something like that going on all the time. Right. So I'm looking for a gig right now for that, for at least the three of us, and maybe a drummer or a bass player, just to present that in public once a week. Huh. I'm having trouble finding a job that wants to pay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness I have several established ones, but you know, just to do my project. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not easy. It's never. 
It's got well, hard. you get started someplace and they decide, well, you got the guys coming in the door, so I'll work for less. Or I'll give you six guys for the same price you're paying them for three. They do that all the time. And further develop, you know, it's, it's scattered. But I'll find something. Yeah. There's something out there. I have, I have no doubt. I really respect the people in town that go out and create jobs. You know, and, and we had some great role models too. And like I mentioned, Orange Kellen, he and Lars Edegren came here from Sweden in the 60s. And they went to work. They, they created jobs. They brought people out of semi-retirement like, like the Hall did when they opened up. They went and found these people, put great bands together, did recording sessions, made world tours and, and uh, gigs, and created projects. <clears throat> and uh, I respect that. That's what we need in this town. You have to go out and beat the, beat the bushes and find somebody that's interested in paying bands and, and something worthwhile and somebody that'll stick with it until it starts to make a profit for them. And it always does if they leave it alone long enough. Right. <coughs> yeah, I interviewed, I interviewed uh, Orange on Monday and he has that really kind of, like that quiet, humble uh, intensity <laughs> that like, he's like, Kind of treating it offhand, like, oh yes, I came here uh, in 1966 with just a bag and stuff, and ended up staying here for <laughs> the rest of my life. Fifty years this yeah. year, yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty, uh, pretty amazing. So, uh, what would you like to see? Like, and it's a, it's a oral history, but like, let's talk a little bit about like 2016 and uh, beyond. Like, what, what would you? What do you see now as like the kind of the future of New Orleans jazz and the kind of traditional jazz here? Is there anything like, do you see this, this new movement of a lot of kids and younger folks moving here after Katrina as like a real positive boon to like the scene here, or do you? Is there anything else that you wish would be going on right now? Like, a, I want to see more more people play this music well. You know, professionally and you know, make make a salary for doing it and, and playing it well. Mm -hmm. um, I want to see more respect for it. I want to see less lip service. New Orleans is famous for lip service. What do you mean by that? Talking about something right. and not doing it. <laughs> for a good example, Satchmo Fest. You know, every year I put in, for the last few years, I put in an excellent band actually playing Louis Armstrong music that, that everybody else isn't playing with world-class musicians. And it's not for the money, it's because I love the music. And because uh, a lot of the other stuff they put out there has nothing to do with Louis Armstrong. Right. It's, and a lot of it's just terrible. So what's the point? I want to see more respect for, for our music here and more knowledge and, more, you know, and less lip service right. talking about it. You can bring in all the scholars from all over the world to give lectures and, and show movies and things like that, of historical things. But if you don't have people that can play the music, what what good is it? it doesn't mean you might as well stay home and listen to records. <laughs> like, that's just me, you know. And I, I've gotten into more arguments with people. I said, okay, you're in, you're in business. I understand that. I'm about the music, so, so excuse me. I'm I'm more interested in the music than I am about business. But my experience with early jazz music is when it's played well with a lot of love and with great musicians, and you're left alone in a place for any length of time, the public loves it. The public loves it. All you have to do is give it to them. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've proved this over and over again by playing excellent music for the public, just the general old public, the tourists and stuff like that. And play, for example, in, in, in this place, I've played uh, Jello Remote and Shreveport Stomp with, with James and Orange on Reeds. And that's a barn burner that he wrote. It's a showpiece. And it's one of the greatest pieces of classic jazz ever written. And people go nuts. We got standing ovations for doing that with just three of us in this place. And I say, look, we're getting this kind of response for playing real New Orleans music that's supposed to be played in this place. Why does someone feel the need to sing Tear the Roof Off the Sucker to get applause? Give me a break. That might be fun sometimes, but you know what I mean? Right. 
There's no reason not to give the public good music. And one of the things I try to leave with people that I teach in the jazz camps and stuff like that, play this music well. Do a good job, even if you're the only one that knows. Because you, you have to do it because you love the music. You know, it doesn't matter if anybody else gets it or not. You just do a good job. You learn your songs and, and present them well. You know, chances are people are going to respond, but even if nobody else does, you still have to do it. You know, it's important. It's what we do. It's our job. You know. So we're going to. I think we're going to kind of we're coming to a natural end here. This is nice. <laughs> uh, uh, so where are you? Where are you living now? You're still living in the quarter. Or are you? Uh... I got an old double in Lakeview that I All right. restored after Katrina. All right. Still in it. And you're just like a, just, you know, spend the rest of your days like playing, doing the best you can. Oh yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine living anywhere else. All right. After Katrina, I couldn't wait to get back. <laughs> um.